So we have spent so much money on cybersecurity and yet we're still getting hacked. What are we seeing here? Today we examine why organizations are still getting compromised by attackers that focus on endpoints and we explore the realistic and effective ways to defend against such attacks. Hi, my name is Jeremy, I'm from Singapore and my specialty is in offensive tactics. I've been performing security assessment for clients in Singapore, um, in the financial, government, and energy sectors. It's been four years, and apart from the standard network, web, mobile applications, uh, I've been working on like automated smart metering infrastructure. And on my free time, I enjoy hunting for vulnerabilities and develop proof of concept exploits. Oh, you can't see the malign there. <laughs> so, Today's agenda will be to briefly discuss the trend and how attackers shifted their attacks from the traditional parameter to favor end users. And then we'll look at both threats from the internal and external perspective. And for the main part of the presentation, we'll be looking at some endpoint controls that is commonly deployed in enterprises and how they can go really wrong. And we have a great, uh, quick, quick study on Duku 2.0 that happened just this year. And finally, we'll go into detect and response and what are things that we can do. So today we'll be talking about laptops and desktops as they are the most issued items in the enterprise. We'll not be talking about tablets, mobile devices, or any BYOD technology. We'll not be touching on Linux or Unix systems as I haven't seen a finance director using spreadsheets on an Ubuntu. So, and most of the examples here today will be on Windows 7 as I think most enterprises are still using Windows 7 as their base image. So to begin, Let's start with the time when internet becomes popular. So it took off in the 90s. Business and government organizations began to take, to see the power of networking and take their businesses and organizations up to online world and start to connect across the globe and into the public internet. However, this led to a huge exposure of many poorly configured services and vulnerable ports which allowed attackers to take advantage of. And one of the well-known ones is the configure worm that exploits the MS-08067. Um, vulnerability. And as a response, organizations started to set up defenses against such attacks by putting out firewalls, doing proper network segregations, and also harden their internet-facing servers. As you can see, a little shields on them. Then came about Web 2.0, where static contents being served online are being changed to dynamic ones. And what are they serving? Pretty much our whole life. Shopping, banking, government services, school administrative services, social media, social media etc. However, people are unaware of the flaws and attackers shifted their attacks from the network to this web unprotected target. Then organizations began to perform code reviews, web pen tests, SDLC process, re-engineering to curb the exposure. And of course, we have the client-side attacks. Attacks of organization employees, key personnel, and even their business partners. There are many ways of attacking endpoint. For example, phishing links and sites, infecting documents, having applications with backdoors, and or directly stealing the device. A lot of such attacks are very effective because they employ elements of social engineering where they exploit the human nature of your employees. Social engineering tactics are effective to help attackers to get into networks which wouldn't have been possible otherwise due to the security controls. For example, in an office you have your RFID cards to tap on the magnetic door which opens for you. Most people will hold the door for the person behind us so as you want to be seen as considerate and nice people. However, an attacker could take advantage of this and gain physical access. So why do we talk about endpoints today? A lot of people will say that, but we already have antivirus. We don't need anything else. Some would say, uh, it's low value targets. How much can they steal from that? And some would argue that we have limited time and budget. Shouldn't we prioritize on servers? Databases, as we have so much to lose in them. Yes, we should prioritize, and today we're going to demonstrate why endpoints should also be your priority. As we briefly went through, attackers shift from the parameter defenses to target users because they become relatively softer targets and much easier to penetrate through the organization. As a result, users, as a result, there are many attacks that happened in the last five years. Operation Aurora 2010, Epsilon, RSS, Flame, JP Morgan, and this year, Tuku 2.0. And often, a single user's device can lead to a massive data breach in your organization.
So for example, attacker is right now outside of the network and he needs to get in. So he needs to establish a foothold using a user's computer. He compromises a user's machine and then he proceeds to perform privilege escalation to gain control of that particular machine. Now gaining this pivot, the attacker will attempt to further escalate himself to gain privileges to access other parts of the network by becoming a domain admin, for example. And then move across the domains in certain bigger organizations. Attacker will want to gain an enterprise admin level access to hop onto other domains. These domains could be newly acquired businesses or subsidiary company across the globe. So basically, a com compromising a user is only the beginning and a single user's device is gonna help the attacker to achieve the goals. So alternatively, an attacker could just hit a high value target directly. Spear phishing is just one of them. It is a form of targeted attack against a person or a group of people using information that's readily found online. So what are the key personnel attackers will target? IT administrators. These administrators have high level access to the network and the systems in the organization. So they will be um, worth to attack. CXOs, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, they would have trade secrets or very privileged information. Or chief researcher whose machine would have access to cutting edge technology and in these cases, privileges, privilege escalation are not required. Just directly attack the endpoint and the end. So what are the main threat scenarios we may face as an organization today? So let's look at the common threat scenarios the endpoint could face. Spear phishing of emails, using emails. Drive-by downloads, for example, using Adobe Flash. For the last half a year, we have seen multiple zero-day vulnerabilities being released, especially after the hacking team incident. And one attack could happen is that, let's say you have a banner that's displayed on a website, and this banner is perhaps the end of the page. If you surf into it, the Adobe Flash loads, and if the Flash banner attacks, exploits your Adobe Flash version that's vulnerable, a malware could be downloaded, and attackers will have access to your machine without you knowing at all. So that is an example of drive-by downloads. What's ring hole attacks? Instead of attack the organization directly, it attacks a trusted entity of this organization. For example, um, you're using x brands laptops for your enterprise and you download the drivers and the software regularly to update the laptops. Attacker could compromise the drivers, the, web, the system of the x brand company and replace all the drivers and software with ones that are with backdoors. So when organizations update their enterprise environment, attackers will have backdoor access into the organization. So in an attempt to defend from such threats, Organizations would commonly have a few or more of these safeguards installed in the system. Regular patching, antivirus, group policy settings, application control, HIPS, FIM, so on and so forth. But the question is, how effective are they? For the next portion of this presentation, we'll look at some of the commonly used endpoint protections and how they can go really wrong. So let's talk about enterprise and corporate machine hardening. In an enterprise environment, administrators will be given most um, users a low privilege, privilege access. They will not be giving them local admin or domain admin. Most organizations will have patch management, security baselines review as part of the hardening process. And all of this is to prevent attackers from gaining remote control or when they are in, to escalate their privileges in the environment. So to prevent exploitation, so goals in security hardening is to prevent exploitation of the operating system's kernel, vulnerabilities, if any, exploitation of any third-party drivers, software, or prevent exploitation of weak configurations. But it is possible to miss out certain things when doing all this. So for example, in this application, it's running at system level. It's basically a software that allows users to switch networks. However, this application has a flaw. An attacker could take advantage of this product and exploit its weak feature and able to get a system level access just like that in five seconds. In cases where threat comes from the inside or someone who has physical access to the machine, getting local administrative rights is even easier, such as a very well-known Windows startup repair hack. So, why is it so bad, 
so bad for someone to have local administrator access. With a local admin access, an attacker or malicious user can do the following actions to gain domain administrator's rights, which is a level we don't want, we never ever want our users to have. Mimikatz is a tool that allows users to extract clear text password from the memory, and all it takes is a domain administrator to log in to the user's machine. So attacker needs to have a local admin and have this tool downloaded from the internet. So for example, the attacker could just call up IT and say, hey, I need help with a made up problem. And in cases where the IT support is unable to reach the user physically, he or she may choose to remotely connect into the system, such as this. And with that, the attacker will be able to retrieve the password fr from the memory on the machine. Again, the Mimikatz tool is free, it's available for download, and a few simple commands will be able to allow the user to, uh, to gain the domain administrator password. So depending on how much access is given to the domain administrator, the attack could then use to log into other machines in the corporate environment. So it could be your employee's machines, servers, or even a domain controller. It's not a good thing. In other cases, it could be a misconfigured domain controller. Attacker would just need to have a user level account, and the user may be able to extract the weekly encrypted password or the C password. So C password is a, it uses a weak encryption scheme that encrypts data with only 32 byte key. Um, that's not good and using a publicly available tool, GPP Decrypt, the attacker or the user could be able to decrypt and obtain the domain admin user's password. So apart from this method, there's still many other ways an attacker can escalate its privileges. This is just some of them. And again, depending on how much rights are being given to this account, attacker will be able to access other parts of the network. So now that we've seen a few examples on certain vulnerabilities and misconfigurations leading that can lead an insider or external th threat in gaining privileged access. Let's look at some more examples on how endpoint protections can be circumvented. One commonly deployed security control is to enforce the restriction of software which allows users to run. So application control is designed to prevent users from running any unauthorized executable files. This will help to reduce the chance of users getting hit by malwares, especially those in executable, executable formats, DLL, batch files, for example. Different products have different mechanics and technology that differs in capabilities, so it's important when you choose the product. And how a system administrator configures the system will yield varying results. A simple illustration would be the use of a common software restriction policy. Administrator intends to restrict users from running the cmd.exe, so for whatever reason, user is not allowed to run cmd.exe file. However, by but an experienced attacker will be able to break out this restriction easily. So instead of running CMD EXE directly, the attacker could just use runs.exe to circumvent the blacklist set by the administrator. Enter the password, there you go. So this is just a very simple example how an attacker could break out of a restricted environment due to a weakly configured policy. Application control can be effective, but only implemented correctly. So another commonly used product is antivirus. It can be signature-based, where no malwares will be hashed, and then the AV needs to be updated regularly. Or it could be heuristics-based, where the malware is being run in a sandbox, contained environment, analyzes its behavior, and such as changes of system files, connecting off the system, etc. However, it's not very effective against intermediate and advanced attackers. The professional malware developers are always improving their codes to evade detection and AV companies are doing the catch-up most of the time. So far, we observe over the years of our testing, AV evasion techniques seems to be always on top and always ahead. So a simple example would be to craft a malware using Metasploit and run it on the web server. So this malware will perform a reverse connection back to the attacker when successfully run. So simulating a, simulating a user downloading the malware, and we try to run it. So we have an AV installed with the latest signature, and the, the antivirus caught it. Good. But it's no surprise, since this Metasploit payload has been around for years, and most AV companies would have the signatures. But what if we use a simple tool called Veil Evasion to craft, to hide our malware? So Veil Evasion tool is mainly used as a proof of concept tool. Other attackers would have their own evasion toolkits. 
and again, it's free. So let's try out the new malware that is, attempts to evade the antivirus, avevade.exe. Let's run it. Did it work? Yes, it did. Our attacker got control, evasion successful. And we try another antivirus against another antivirus. So we use the malware.exe, the generic one. Oh, it caught it even before we tried to download it. It says that it's infected with a Trojan Win32 generic. So what if we use AV Evade instead? Okay, this time there's no warning on the web page. That's not good. What if we run it? Perhaps you can catch it doing then. Nope, evaded the second antivirus successfully. Some would say that, Jeremy, you're looking at each control individually. Why don't you combine them together so that security controls will work superbly? It's like a layered defense, right? So for the next few slides, I wanted to share on the actual job we did a couple of months ago. So the company wanted to strengthen their endpoints, and it's their goal to prevent intrusion into the endpoint. So they set up like a couple of controls on the endpoint device and hoping that this would stop them. They set up automated page patching, antivirus software, an application control software, and a HIPS. So the intention is that automatic patching will fix any known vulnerabilities. So any OS vulnerabilities will, will patch it and you can't exploit it. Antivirus to defend any known malware or exploitations used commonly. Application control to prevent any execution of exact, um, exe files, batch files, DIL files, based on a hash whitelist mechanism. And lastly, they have HIPS, or host intrusion prevention system, to prevent exploitations using application sandbox technology, hopefully to defend against zero-day vulnerabilities. So it seems like, and we are being taken task to assess the device. So it seems like they have the ultimate defense, right? They have this onion that's wrapped up, and it's really, really solid. And you think that, yeah, no attacker will be able to break through all these controls. It's pretty locked down. We spent a couple of days, and admittedly, there, these security products made, it, made us really hard. As it made it really hard for us to do our job. And however, we managed to break in with just one thing, the PowerShell. It's installed by default on all your operating systems today. And one line, all it takes, this one line. So some would say that, come on, Jeremy, this is not realistic. No one would do that, all that typing and get owned. So we thought, yeah, we can't report that. So, and then I found that you could actually use a shortcut link, and it still worked perfectly. Send it over email, survey over web page. Example, Ted here, doesn't know what's going on. Okay, totally not suspicious. Link, click on it. Boom, attacker's got control. AV didn't work. Software whitelist is not relevant because it's PowerShell. It's in your system. Host intrusion prevention didn't work. It's not an exploit. Patching is irrelevant since PowerShell is a Windows feature. As we can see from this scenario, more security products thrown into one endpoint doesn't mean it's more secure. It's, there's always ways for an attacker to break in. And although they make it really difficult, it's like speed bumps along the way, there's no such thing as ultimate defense. What we just witnessed is just some examples, and there's a huge list of arsenals we could test. We can go on for the next 45 minutes on everything, but that's, you guys get the point, my point. So yeah, we just witnessed some of the commonly used endpoint controls and how they can be defeated. So now let's look at a real case scenario that happened this year in 2015. I'm sure you have heard of Dooku 2.0, anyone? Cool. This is when prevention failed. Possibly the same team who did Dooku 2.0 did the Dooku in 2011 that's linked to the Stuxnet. Attackers targeted a few organizations across the globe, and Kaspersky is one of them. One of the staff from a small office in the Asia Pacific region was spearfished, and apparently they, are, they found out that it was the patient zero. So it was the first a malware in document embedded with multiple zero day exploits. It's really stealthy, it did not create or modify any system files. It propagates by, by installing the way an administrator would propagate, would deploy the software using MSI files. And multiple zero days that, is, that, has, been, that has been patched, of course. So all these are the Microsoft, the three Microsoft um, in Texas. So it was very advanced, multiple zero days. Including both, uh, including all three: remote execution, local privilege escalation, and domain escalation. 
it was detected only after malware got in and generated some suspicious activities within the network. This was said to be an espionage mission to find out how they can future-proof Kaspersky defense. And it was said to cost about $50 million. So we, from this amount of money, we could suspect that it's a nation-state-sponsored campaign. So why are we talking about this today? Number one, it targeted on users' endpoint. Preventive controls did not work. Zero Day defeated the regular patching that Kaspersky claimed to have done. And antivirus failed to detect the presence of it. I mean, it's a new malware. And it was detected only after the breach. Sounds very similar to today's topic. So this is an example of how preventive controls can fail on an endpoint and result in a breach. So what have we learned from all this from above? Role-based access control is very necessary. Do not give administrator full access right to your entire network. Segregation to control is very important. Product limitations. Whatever products that you're using, there's always limitations in the deployment or in the implementation or the reconfiguration. For example, antivirus is not as effective as we want it to be, as we can see from the examples. But that doesn't mean that we should cut out antivirus from our budget next year. Just as long as we understand that security it provides is very, very limited. Misconfiguration diminishes the effectiveness of a control. And this requires the implementation and configuration of the control is key. You may have a very good product, but if you don't configure it properly, it does not work. Software restriction or application control is extremely useful. As um, our colleague just said, that it's the top control in the, by the ASD list. So one of the few ways that you could do is do whitelisting instead of blacklisting, avoid path name and file names, and use hash instead. Phishing training is very important to educate employees on the dangers of phishing attacks and what they should do when they face a suspicious email so that it can prevent someone like him entering your network. That's Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Sorry, can't see that well. <laughs> yeah. It is not an easy task to consider everything, but even if you have the best IT administrators, best internal security consultants, you still have zero day vulnerabilities that comes in your network and ruin the day. Wow. So the cold hard truth is prevention controls can fail. So how can we be secure then? For security to be robust, it must include all three controls. Beyond just prevention, you need detection, you need response. Had not the organization picked up the signs of compromise in the network, they, would have caught the they wouldn't have caught the malware and dealt with it. So let's use the bank vault as an example. A bank vault is a, or a strong room is a secure space with money, gold, documents, um, records is being stored. No one, you don't want anyone is unauthorized to get in. So a bank vault is installed with extremely thick walls, reinforced with multi panel concrete with steel rods within. The bank does not just stop there. The bank goes on to have 24-hour surveillance cameras, have alarms, have patrol armed guards in the premise, and they also have panic buttons in easy to reach places in case of an event of intrusion or bank robbery. So we have preventive controls, detection, and response teams ready at all time. So how can we apply the same principles in information security? First, we need to understand how an attacker works. The following slides will provide a brief overview of a typical attack faces. Understand how an attacker works. One, attacker usually will do reconnaissance from the outside. Once the attacker get in, you'll try to escalate privileges and try to establish a foothold within the system. So the infiltration takes place. Once and proceed to call back to the command and control server, the C2 server, commonly known. Attackers will then use the malware to gain access to the network and then do further reconnaissance within the network. When an attacker sees something that's of interest, the attacker will then exfiltrate the data out of the network. Depending on the, the intent, they could paste in the data, they could sell them to the black market or feed them to the intelligence agencies of their countries. And if you're interested in areas of targeted attacks, in the afternoon talks, there'll be more. And to provide more depth and details of what APT attacks look like and what kind of methods they employ. So stay tuned. But in this particular case, we're interested in how we can use this typical pattern to design certain detection mechanisms that could help us to detect the common, common indicators of compromise. For example, if data is to be stolen, the attackers would at one point require to exfiltrate the data out of the network. And there's 
probably there's only certain few, point, few areas that attackers can do that. So assuming that attackers is interested in getting the data out, at some point, a large, possibly a large voluminous transmission could happen out of the network. So that is a clear sign. And or beacons that happens. So when attackers manage to lodge the malware in one of your users, that's not good enough, right? Then you get a, get a beacons out of the network to inform the attacker that, hey, we managed to get in. It's time to get in through this back door. So sometimes this regular transmission could be occurring outside of working hours. So this could be suspicious, a sign for investigation. Or DNS requests, if you're lucky, some other companies would have flagged this malware out and you know, there is a database that says that, oh, these are the sites, the list of sites that have bad reputations. This is also one of the indicator. For some host based indications, would be suspicious files or processes that's been introduced into your network, new services that's been disguised as legitimate tool and set to auto start. For example, you have like 200 laptops, but only have two laptops with this new service. It's probably something to look at. Changes in the registry, of course. Other behaviors like um, web surfing behaviors, you can't expect a user to click like 500 HTTP requests within a minute. That's not usually what happens if a human is using it. It's probably a, a script, a robot. And in other cases where organization has set a standard to say that, okay, everyone will be using Internet Explorer and nothing else. So if you see a user agent string that is being used that's not part of the organization standard, it's a sign. Suspicious administrative accounts. New admin accounts created that does not belong to any of the employees or part of the documented change process. It's a clear warning sign. And there are many, many more indicators like process hollowing, DR injections, reflective DR loading, which we'll not be discussing today, but these are also signs to indicate a compromise. So how are your detection capabilities today? Remember, one can only respond to attack if you're aware of it. Most large organizations will have 24 hours monitoring on the network or, or end host. If you have logging in your system, that's great, but do you have people looking at it? Given that the attacker has slipped past your preventive controls, your best bet is to catch them as early as possible before any damage or siphoning of data is done. So say if a malware has been found and suspect it's a malicious where, what can you do about it? So some people will directly hash it or upload directly to the virus total and check whether it's a known malware. If not, do you have people that are able to help you analyze and dissect and tells you what's going on? And ascertaining the degree of infection. So one of the ways to do this is to check out the indicators of compromise. So how do the malware spreads, propagates itself? How do malware installs itself? What kind of network level actions does the malware does? Any DNS requests, any outbound connection to a certain IP addresses? So those will help you to ascertain the degree of infection and compromise. So let's say now that you've determined that this portion of the network is clean, this portion are infected, okay, are you gonna surgically extract them out confidently and know that oh, there'll be no traces left? Or are you gonna like eradicate the entire and do a full reinstall? If you're doing a full reinstall, do you have regular backups ready in your system to restore that so you can get back to business? So these are the things that you may want to consider and be ready before a breach happens. So summary, one system can lead to a compromise of entire organization, just one system. More products doesn't mean better security. Preventive controls are essential but does not provide 100% guarantee. A lot of organizations we have seen have place great emphasizes, emphasis on Preventive controls, they have VAPTs, they have security hardening, they have reviews, they have um, segregations, they've got them tested regularly. However, not much thoughts have been placed in detect and response. And we hope that the preventive controls, and they hope that the preventive controls will like, take care of everything. As we have seen, that's not very realistic. As such, we advise organizations to raise the bar and put in more resource in detection and response and make it a more robust security in the systems. So is your endpoint the weakest link in your network today? If you have not looked at it for a while, probably is. Thank you.